Okay, we are now standing at the site, which is basically the reason we're here. Okay, in back of me is the building that sits atop the caves of Machpelah. We know 100% that the site that we read about in the Bible, when it says that Abraham had to buy a cave to bury his wife Sarah, we know that that's right here. And of course, the big question is, how do we really know that? There are a few answers to that question. First of all, this building that we're looking at was built 2,000 years ago by Herod when he was king of Judea. Interesting, interestingly enough, it was announced last night that uh, archaeologists from the Hebrew University found Herod's tomb in Herodian. Um, <coughs> Herod lived 2,000 years ago, which is 1,700 years after Abraham. But we figure if he built this kind of a structure that's been here for 2,000 years and nothing is missing, no stones missing, there are of course additions to the original building, but if he built this kind of a structure on the site that he knew to be the tomb of the patriarchs and, patriarchs and matriarchs, then he had a good reason for it. Number two, over here behind us there are archaeological, archaeological excavations that were done. You don't see too much there today. But when they did those, they found underneath burial caves from the Canaanite era, i.e. the days of Abraham. The third reason that we know that this is really it is because people have been inside those caves. And when we go upstairs, it's my hope that we'll sit down and I will tell you how people were able to get into the caves themselves and exactly where they are. But before that, a couple of important points of introduction. First of all, what we're going to do now in a couple of minutes is something that no Jew nor any Christian were allowed to do for 700 years. In the year 1260, Mamluks threw out the Crusaders. This site went back and forth between the Christians and the Muslims over a period of hundreds and hundreds of years. In the 300s, the Christians came in here and they built a church inside, a basilica. The Muslims came in in the 600s, threw out the Christians and turned it into a mosque. In 1100, the Christians came back, threw out the Muslims, turned it back into a church. In 1260, the Mamluks threw out the Crusaders, and in 1267 they declared it off limits to anybody who's not Muslim. And from 1267 until 1967, nobody who was not Muslim was allowed to go inside. There used to be stairs going up the eastern side of the building over here, and that's as far as people could go up to pray. Jews that came here and wanted to worship could go up to the seventh step, and that was as far as they were allowed to go until exactly 40 years ago next week when we came back and today it's accessible to just about anybody who wants to be able to go inside. <clears throat> now one short story I'd like to tell you before we go inside. June 1967, the Six Day War breaks out. <clears throat> On the 28th day of ER by the Hebrew calendar, the first week of June, Israel liberates the old city of Jerusalem and takes back the Western Wall just underneath Temple Mount. One of the first Jews to be there at that time was the chief rabbi of the Israeli Defense Forces, Rabbi Shlomo Gorin. And he knew that the next day the army was coming to Hebron, and he knew that this site had been off limits for 700 years. You've got to keep in mind, this is the second holiest site of the Jewish people in all the world. He leaves Jerusalem, he arrives at Gush Etzion, halfway between Jerusalem and Hebron. He finds the army there, they just liberated the site. He gives him a little pep talk, and he says, Tomorrow you're going to Hebron, I'm going with you. He goes to sleep. A few hours later he wakes up, and there's nobody there. No army, no soldiers, no trucks. <clears throat> he wakes up his driver. He said, They didn't want to take us with them. Get in the, get in the, get in the Jeep, we're going to catch up with them. So in the middle of the Six-Day War, Rabbi Gorin, together with his driver, start to drive from Gush Etzion into Hebron. Now in those days there were no bypass roads. He comes through all of the Arab villages and cities, he gets to the outskirts of Hebron, and he sees something very strange. Hanging from the rooftops and the windows are white sheets and pillowcases. He very quickly realized the Arabs were surrendering. Nobody was shooting at them. Why not? The Arabs remembered very well what they'd done to us here in 1929, and they were afraid we were going to repay the favor. So the men fled, the women and children hung, the, hung these sheets outside, nobody moved. He comes down the main road, he doesn't stop where we are here, he goes around, on the other side of this wall is actually the main entrance to the building. 
He stops his Jeep at the bottom of the stairs, runs up the stairs, finds upstairs two metal doors locked. He starts pounding on the doors. He hears somebody inside telling him to go away. <clears throat> runs back to his Jeep, gets his Uzi submachine gun. This was, of course, before they had M16s. Runs back up and starts shooting at the doors that didn't open the doors because they met out of metal. But I can attest to the fact, bullet holes still there. They put chains on the doors, hook them onto the Jeep, pull the doors down. He runs inside and he starts to pray. The Arab Mufti of Hebron sends a representative send, saying he wants to surrender. Rabbi Gorin says no. The tomb of the patriarchs is a place of prayer and peace. Go surrender someplace else, which is what they did. Later he told us the real reason he didn't accept the surrender. He said, I'm a general. I'm going to give them the honor to surrender to a general, let them surrender to a sergeant, which is also what they did. <laughs> However, I have of course neglected to tell you the most important part of the story, a little bit of sunstroke, you know, gets to after a while. When Rabbi Gorin left Gush Etzion, he was going to catch up with the army. Where were they? What he didn't realize is that Gush Etzion down the road is actually a big hill. The Israeli army didn't know the Arabs in Hebron were going to surrender. They were still back there planning the attack. In other words, he came in all by himself and liberated the city for the Jewish people. That's how he came back to Hebron. With that, we are going to go inside. We are now sitting inside the building on top of the caves of Machpelah. I told you earlier when we started the tour, when we were up in Tel Rumeda, that Abraham paid 400 silver shekels for this. It was like a million dollars. And of course, the question is asked, why was he willing to pay so much money for it? What was so special about it? It's written in our holy books that Abraham discovered something very important at this site. It's written that he was sitting outside his home, waiting for some guests to come, he saw three men coming. He called to Sarah and he said, Sarah, I'll put up some steaks. And she said, we finished it all last night. So he went to the pen to get a calf to make some fresh meat. But he must have gone into the pen with the knife in his hand because one of these sheep saw him, caught what was going on and didn't like the idea and took off. Abraham went running after it. He wanted it back. All of a sudden, in the distance, it disappeared. He kept running, and he saw a cave. He thought maybe it had run into the cave. So he goes over to the cave, and he peers inside, and he sees something very strange. He sees inside the cave a light glowing. A light glowing inside of a cave. Very, very strange. He goes in to investigate, to see what it is. And it's written that there he discovers the tombs of the first man and the first woman of Adam and Eve. And it's written that he could smell the fragrances of the Garden of Eden. How did they come to be in this cave? It's written that after they were exiled from the Garden of Eden, they wanted to go back. But they had a problem, they didn't know where it was. So they searched and they searched until they came to a particular place where they too could smell the very, very special fragrances the unique fragrances from the Garden of Eden. And there the first man started to dig. It's written that he dug a cave within a cave until a voice from the heavens said, Stop, that's as far as you can go. That's where Eve was buried, and that's later where Adam was buried. And that site remained hidden until the days of Abraham. That's why this site is called, in Hebrew, Apetach Lagan Eden, the entrance to paradise. It's written in our books that a person's soul when it leaves this world on the way to the next world, goes through the cave of Machpelah on its way to the next world above. Abraham, realizing how holy this site was, realized that one day he wanted to, to remain for his people forever. And that's why he bought this site for 400 silver shekels, a tremendous amount of money. The building that we're in right now has two parts. There's an upstairs and there's a downstairs. The downstairs we have no access to. The upstairs here have three rooms. <clears throat> the room over here to my right is a memorial room to Jacob and Leah. The room on my left is a memorial room for Abraham and Sarah. 
And the big room behind that is a memorial room for Isaac and for Rebecca. That room today is off limits to us. We have no access to that, <coughs> excepting 10 days a year. I stress that they're only memorial rooms. Abraham and Sarah are not in that room, and Jacob and Leah are not in that room. They're in caves all the way below us. And what people, of course, are interested in knowing is where exactly those caves are. How could we access those caves? If we were to go into the big room, which today we don't have access to, the Isaac Memorial Room, it's a very, very large room, a very pretty room, a very ornate room. If we went straight in through here and turned right, a little bit off the wall is a monument. It's a brown monument with a dome up top, four marble pillars come down to the floor, and in the middle of those pillars is a flower-shaped piece of marble with a hole in the middle. That hole goes all the way down into the caves of Machpelah. When we came back here in 1967, then the defense minister, Moshe Dayan, wanted to know it was down there. The only problem was that that hole is about 23 or 24 centimeters in diameter. No normal person could get through it. So in October of 1968, he brought in one night a little girl. The little girl's name was Michal. She was 12 years old. And little Michal had two very important characteristics. Number one, she was very skinny. And number two, she was very brave. Because they brought her in in the middle of the night. They threw everybody out. They opened the hole. They tied a rope around her waist, gave her a flashlight, and started to lower her down that hole all by herself so that she could investigate and see what was beneath. You know, the truth is that for you to understand the significance of this story, I'm going to have to stop for a minute and give you an introduction. You know, we'll leave little Michal dangling for a minute. She'll wait for us. Let me go back a few hundred years. We're going back to the middle of the 1600s. This whole area was under the rule of the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. At one point in time, the Sultan from Turkey came to visit Neretz Yisrael, and he came to Hebron. He came to Marat Amach Pelah. He went into that room, and he was looking down that very same hole which was open then. Now in those days, of course, they didn't have Uzis or M16s. They had jeweled sabers. He had a sword attached to his belt. And he was looking down the hole, and the sword fell through his belt down that hole. And he wanted it back. He called over one of his soldiers and said, go get it. <clears throat> they tied a rope around his waist, lowered him down. He got to the bottom of the cave, by the bottom of that hole in a big room. All of a sudden, everybody up top heard this huge scream. They called him in and he didn't answer. They started to pull on the rope. They finally got him out. He was dead. They sent another one down and the same thing happened to him. A third one, a fourth one. Finally, the Sultan looked at his Arab host and said, what am I going to do? I want my sword back, but my soldiers are dying. So the Arab said, you know, there are Jews that live in Hebron. Let's head the Jew down. Who cares what happens to them? They went to the Jewish quarter just down the road. Now, you've got to remember that at that time, Jews were forbidden from coming in here. And they'd heard what was going on. They were petrified. The Arab comes in and says, who wants to go into Marat Machpelah? And they all said, thanks, but no thanks. So the Arab said, look, either you send somebody down or else. So they said, give us a few days. And for three days they fasted and they prayed. And on the third day, the Arab goes back and he says, who's going? And the rabbi of the community says, me. And he wears all white clothing. They bring him inside here. They tie a rope around his waist and they lower him down the hole. He gets to the bottom, he's standing in a big room, he looks around and he sees standing in back of him an old man. He looks at the old man and says, who are you? The old man says, who am I, who are you? He said, I'm the rabbi of Hebron. I came to get the sultan's sword. The old man looks at him and he says, my name is Eliezer. I'm Abraham's servant. Wait, I have to ask permission if you can come inside. And he disappeared. And a few seconds later, he sees standing in front of him three old men. And he looks at them, and he looks at them, and he understands who they are. And he says, my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you're here and I'm here, why should I go back up there? I want to stay here with you. And they said to him, our son, you have to take the sword back so they don't kill the Jews in Hebron. But if you want, you can come back next week. 
So he took the sword back up and the Jews in Hebron made a big festivity out of it. He saved their lives. He spent that week studying with all of his pupils, with all of his students. Exactly one week later to the day he passed away, he's buried here in the ancient Jewish cemetery in Hebron. You're probably not familiar with such literature, but he's known as the Chesed Lavram, Rabbi Avram Azulai. Very, very important rabbi. He was a great, great grandfather of another very, very important rabbi, the Chida. And that's the story of how he went down into the caves of Machpelah and met our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> now we come back to little Michal, the 12-year-old, who's dangling and waiting for me to finish the story. Everybody up top knew that story. And nobody had any idea what was going to happen to this little girl when she got down to the bottom. They lower her all the way down. She gets to the bottom. She finds herself in a big circular room. She looks around. To one side, she sees what look like three monuments on the wall. In this direction, though, she sees a tunnel. And she starts to walk. According to her account, she walks 17 meters. At the end of the tunnel, there are stairs. She goes up the stairs. At the top, it's sealed with a rock, comes back down the stairs, through the tunnel into the room, and they pull her out. And that was all they found. Now, we knew there was more there, but we had no way to investigate. And you will rightfully ask, why not? We'd come back, right? It was ours. Except that our old friend, the defense minister, Dayan, in 1967, when we came back, and the Mufti of Hebron came to him and said, here, now the keys to the holy place belong to you, Dayan said, what are you talking about? They belong to you. And he gave them back, leaving the control of this holy site in the hands of the Waqf, the Muslim Religious Trust. They decided who went where, when, how. We had no control over anything. However, however, people measured. This little girl said she had gone down the hole, she'd walked 17 meters. So we measured. People measured 17 meters from where she was in the direction she walked. And lo and behold, exactly opposite the monument here, with the hole on the floor, 17 meters away, on the other side of the hall, is another monument. The big difference between the two of them is that here there's a hole in the floor, and the other monument on the floor is an Arab prayer rug. And there's always somebody guarding it. We have no idea what's underneath that rug. And that's the way things remain for many years. We now jump from 1968 to 1981. 1981, there are people living back in the city of Hebron itself. People used to come down here to worship during the day and at night and for the holidays and before the holidays. Before the holidays of the Jewish New Year of Rosh Hashanah, people came down in the middle of the night to say special preparatory prayers for the coming of the New Year. And they would come down in the middle of the night and pray. The Arab guards got tired of watching them. They have an office over here in the corner. They would leave and go to sleep. As soon as they left to sleep, somebody went over to that rug on the floor and picked it up. And underneath it on the floor was a piece of rock held onto the floor with nails. So a few nights later, they brought some tools with them. And when the Arabs went to sleep, they went to work. And after a little while, they were able to move the rock. And underneath it was a hole in the floor. They managed to get through that hole. They went down the stairs the little girl had gone up, through the tunnel, into the circular room where everybody had been lowered down. And they started to search. And at first, they didn't find anything. Now, one of the men didn't have a flashlight. He had a candle. And he was looking on the floor, and the candle extinguished. He relit it. Again, it went out. He put his hands on the floor, and he felt air coming up. If there's wind coming from underneath, there has to be something there. They started to push away the rocks, and that's when they discovered the entrance into the actual caves of Machpelah. They crawled in. They burrowed in on their stomachs. They found themselves in a large cave. They went all the way through that cave. At the end of the cave, they came to the entrance of the second cave. In Hebrew, the word Ma'arat HaMachpelah literally means double cave. They went into the second cave, and in here, much smaller than the outer cave, they discover two things. They discover remnants of pottery, and they discover remnants of human bones. An archaeologist later checks the pottery. He says it's not 3,700 years old. It doesn't go back to the days of Abraham. The pottery is only... 2,900 years old, going back to the days of King Solomon and the, Jude the Judean kings. 
when it seems that there was a custom that people would bring bones of people already deceased in these clay jars into the caves themselves so they'd be buried adjacent to the patriarchs and the matriarchs. Now these guys had been down there for a long time. They had to get out before anybody found them. They stopped and they prayed. In our prayers that we say three times a day, we begin by talking about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is it. This is where they've been for almost 4,000 years. These are probably the first Jews that have had the privilege to pray inside these caves to be there in thousands and thousands of years. They finished, they came back up, pushed the rock back. When the Arabs discovered that we'd gone down, the final result was that they sealed that with concrete, so today there's no access. However, there are pictures on the Hebron website, very, very easy to remember, hebron.com, or the Maratha Machpelah website, machpelah.com. You can see pictures inside the actual caves themselves, the location of those caves, inside the room there in the middle, the back wall all the way down is where the actual caves are. The caves that we read about in the Bible that Abraham bought for 400 silver shekels to bury his wife Sarah, right there underneath us. Today, the building is broken down into two parts upstairs. We have this area, the Arabs have the big room around, they control about 80% of the building. We have 20% of the building. 10 days a year, we get the whole thing. 10 days a year, they get the whole thing. The rest of the time, it's like it is today. Eventually, that will change, but that's the way it is for the moment. A lot of times, people ask me why we live in Hebron. Us, the Muslims, he says, it's not a church. It's not a synagogue. It's a mosque, and only Muslims can pray there. Now, of course, this building was built 600 years before Muhammad was born but that doesn't make any difference. It's a mosque and only they can pray here. If we didn't live here in Hebron, not only wouldn't we be here and not only wouldn't you be here, but the 500,000 people that come here every year wouldn't be here. That's why we're here to make sure that this should be accessible to anybody that wants to identify with their roots. This is it right here. Um, I want to thank you very much for coming in. It's for me uh, really a pleasure to be able to spend time with people like you. We appreciate very much your being here. Uh, it's very important for us and it's very important for you. We hope that when you go back home, you'll tell people that we're here. You'll tell them it's a little different from what they see on CNN and read in the newspapers. Let your politicians know that you were here and how important this is to all of us. And anybody that ever comes back, you feel free to call us. We'd be very happy to see you again.